you know, I remember when if you blinked, he was already gone. <laughs> like, you coming here? They say, and I still haven't figured out who they are, but they say that money is a curse. God, may you smite me with it. <laughs> and may I never recover. Now, I would like to take credit for that, but actually, uh, I've mentioned before that I enjoy theater, and uh, that's actually a line from Fiddler on the Roof when uh, Herchek, the young Russian student, is talking with Tevya, and uh, we find out later Perchek is actually a communist back before the revolution, and uh, but we won't get too technical. And so he's said, telling Tevya that, and that was Tevya's response. It seems as if money is often spoken of in scripture. In fact, Jesus, that was one of Jesus' main teachings, was money and finances. Paul writes a lot about it. There must be a reason that it's mentioned so often, and you're probably already ahead of me, and realize it's written a lot about because it is definitely a problem. When Paul was writing to Timothy, we had the false teachers coming in, and Paul identifies them. Last week, we talked a little bit about their, uh, their characteristics and the way that they can twist scripture. So now that we continue with that thought, still in verses 3 through 5, Timothy is warned to avoid those who just want to make money from preaching. And you say, Skip, are there really people like that? Yes. We see it all the time on television or on the radio. We hear it on the radio, and nowadays it's online. Where it seems as if the teacher is merely interested in the finances they can get, and not necessarily the word of God. Men have compromised over it, and we'll, we'll get into that a little bit. So Timothy is warned, avoid these. Um, well, let me just say, it's a big, big problem in Uganda. A lot of the men are in the ministry because it's an easy way to make money, not because they necessarily love and want to serve Jesus Christ. And so the, the Ugandans um, are put upon by these, uh, these wolves, and because they do love the Lord, they fall into the trap of following the leader. It's a problem everywhere. And too often, money becomes the chief goal of religious teachers who become willing to preach any kind of false doctrine, stir up trouble in churches simply to make money. When in reality, godly living should be the chief goal. And we won't go over it in detail again, but you're finding that warning in the verses three through we now get to verse 6, which says, but <laughs> it would say it if I could see it. But godliness actually is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment. This statement is one of the keys to spiritual growth and personal fulfillment. The false teachers, their God was finances. This verse is saying, 
Well, yes, belonging to Christ, following him, can be gain, but there's the balance of seeing wealth with eternal eyeglasses. Look at it from an eternal point of view, and Paul will give us a little bit more about that in just a moment. So basically, this verse is telling us that we should honor God and center our desires on Him. Most of you even now are thinking of Matthew 6.33, uh, which, which, uh, which says, But seek ye first God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Or maybe you're remembering uh, Psalm 37, 4 that says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Or Psalm 34, 10, They who seek the Lord shall not be in want of any good thing. All through Scripture, there are these promises, but you'll notice... There's also a condition. I call verses like this condition promise verses. Uh, when I'm training teachers, we have a we have a one of the one of the seminars workshops. Call it what you want. Is uh, how to give an invitation. How to when you're teaching, give your hearers that chance to respond to Jesus Christ. Well, one of the principles is that you always give, well, you teach scripture, but at the very end, you always give a verse that we call condition promise. Let me just give you a couple examples. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved. Condition, believe. Promise, you shall be saved. Romans, call upon the name of the Lord, and you shall be saved. Condition, call. Promise, be saved. Um, John 1 12. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to them that believe on his name. Believe, receive, condition, you shall be God's child. Promise. So God gives many, many promises. Some are just blanket promises, others are have a condition. And so we're seeing that when it comes to wealth, desires, things for us, God put a condition on it because he knows our hearts. Seek first the kingdom. And these things will be added. Delight in the Lord and he'll give you your desires. Um, seek the Lord and he'll not withhold any good thing. Condition, promise. Too many times, people want to jump to the promise and forget the condition. We should be content with what God is doing in our lives. Now, I've said this before, but one of the most difficult things when you teach through a book like this is you can't ignore what's coming next. You can't jump over it, you have to cover it. And I have to admit to you that there have been more times than I care to remember that I was not content. This is a very hard section for me. I read this section often. Um, because godliness is a game when followed by contentment. And there have been times, no, I wasn't content. And God had to deal with me. But I couldn't ignore this section and go, well, no, I don't want to talk about it. Uh, we'll just skip over. Which maybe some of you were hoping because we get through First Timothy quicker. It's like, skip, how much longer are we going to be in First Timothy? 
Uh, we're, we're headed towards the end. But this is an extremely, extremely important section. Uh, you need to remember that money does not bring about happiness. And this is a lesson most people never learn. Um, I believe it was Rockefeller was asked, how much money is enough? Now, at the time, he was one of the richest men in the world. And you know what his answer was? A little bit more. A little bit more. Was he a happy man? We get the idea, no. Then maybe some of you have heard the stories or have seen it on news or read it, where the majority of lottery winners, after they win the millions, one, are usually miserable, two, it's gone within a matter of a couple of years, and they're back to where they were before. Money does not bring about happiness. It doesn't give joy. Is money necessary? Yeah, it's necessary. And does God not want us to have things? No, not at all. But this whole section, Paul is talking about the warning, but then he's also telling Timothy, remember why you're in the ministry. Remember what you're doing. And then it becomes a lesson for everybody. So, rich or poor, people always want more. Greed is not just for rich people. It's also for poor people. That's like, gluttony is not just for overweight people. Gluttony can be used by skinny people too. It's a matter of attitude. And so, Paul actually gives us in this section of scripture some guidelines concerning our attitude. Before I get to that, I want to back up just a bit because I skipped over it in my notes. Um, did you know? Well, no, you don't. That's why I'm telling you. I was actually had the potential to be a false teacher. 2018 BC, before COVID. <laughs> Things were going great. You know, the country was fine. And uh, I came up with this idea of looking at scripture that Jesus Christ was going to do something in 2018 that we would probably have the rapture. Um, mathematically, it worked out signs of the times, it was working out. Now, you all know the verse that says, no man knows the day or the time, only God himself. So by rights, anything I was coming up with is wrong. In fact, if you want to know a good time when Jesus is not coming back, just let somebody set a date, and you know he's not going to come then. Well, I didn't set a date. I set a year. Okay, that's not setting a date. I want to make that very clear. I set a year. I only told a couple of friends this. I didn't preach it from the pulpit or anything like that. I said, and as I was explaining it to, to my friends, they said, well, Skip, that does make a lot of sense. Are you going to do anything about it? And I said, you know what I ought to do? I should write a book. It's early enough. I mean, I, this idea came to me early in 2008. I said, I should write a book. 
and get it published and get it out there. Okay. Do you know how forgiving Christians are? <laughs> so that even if you're wrong, they tend to forgive you? Some of you have been Christians long enough. Do you remember the little booklet called 88 Reasons Why Jesus is Coming Back in 1988? Anybody remember that? I may have finally gotten rid of it, but I kept that pamphlet for years. It was on my heresy shelf. I have a book. I have a part of my, my bookshelf that's heresies. And that was in there for a while. Okay, so I've been around long enough to watch this happen over and over again. Somebody teaches something. It's questionable, but it makes sense. A lot of Christians jump onto it. The guy or woman that came up with it makes goo-goo bucks off of it. You know, the, the pamphlet or the booklet sells, and they have special speaking. And, and then it doesn't happen. Does the person get stoned as a false prophet, which is biblical? No. Christians tend to forgive, and they forget. And those people are still teaching today. So I was thinking, well, even if I'm wrong, I'll make my money, and then everybody will forget and forget. I have nothing to lose. I would like to tell you that God spoke to my heart and said, you know, this is foolish, don't do it. But do you know why I never did it? Because I'm lazy. <laughs> I just didn't feel like taking all that trouble to write this thing down and proofread it and take it to a publisher and all of that stuff. It was like, oh, this is too much like work. I just won't bother doing it. Now, it's a good thing I didn't because I would have stepped out of God's will and have become what Paul is writing about false teacher who was in it for the money. <laughs> well, when 2019 hit, my friends immediately called me and said, hey, Skip, guess you were wrong, huh? I said, yeah, but it was uh, worth a shot. Um, I, liked, I liked the idea. I thought it was a pretty cool idea that uh, the rapture was going to happen in 2018, and uh, <sighs> we're now in 2023, and we're still here. So we need to be doing all that we can for Jesus Christ now. But yeah, I had the potential of being a false teacher. God protected me from it. And uh, there we have it. Told you, not an easy section for me. So anyway, Paul writes some guidelines in verses, the following verses that we're covering, um, on what to do towards money, riches, wealth, mammon, the old King James term. Call it whatever you want, but it's an unhealthy um, obsession with things, as opposed to God. Temporal instead of eternal. So let's see what the, the guidelines are. First one that Paul writes is, realize that one day riches will all be gone. We find this in verse 7. For we have brought nothing into the world so we cannot take anything out of it either. And then again in verse 17, which we'll look at in a few, in a couple weeks, but it says, 
instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly supplies us with all things. So yes, we're going to be hitting some of these topics again, but repetition is good. So Paul's saying, Riches are not always going to be here. Now, I have been told, and today it's like I've been told a lot of stuff, um, that when a baby is born, they come into the world with their fists closed. Like, eh, me, mine, mine. That's how they're born. I don't know because I have never seen the birth of a baby. Don't plan to. <laughs> we have, as you know, three children. I miss Amanda's birth. Um, she was quick. Within 45 minutes, Rosie went into labor, had birth, and it was all over. Amanda was like, never gave Rosie a bit of trouble when it came to birth. She was quick and fairly easy, relatively speaking. See, now I'm talking about things I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea what you women go through, but my understanding is it was quick and fairly easy. I wasn't around, you know, and it was born. That was it. And, uh, yeah, she has uh, always been easy. Jesse, oh, and then with Caleb, Rosie was in labor for like forever. <laughs> we, I was there, we walked up and down the hospital, you know, hallways. Um, I told Rosie, try jumping. Um, <laughs> you know, I was like, this kid's not coming. And I was there for hours, ready to support my wife and to be with her. And finally, Rosie told me, don't just go home. <laughs> it, it's, evidently, I wasn't that much support. I don't know. Um, but she said, yeah, just go on home. You know, and it uh, doesn't seem like Caleb is coming. And uh, so I listened to her because I had found it's better to listen to her than to cross her. Um, we've been married long enough, and don't let that cute little size fool you. Um, so I went home, and back then, no cell phones. Okay, so it wasn't like I got into the parking lot to get a phone call. I got home and got a phone call that Rosie had, you know, the kid was born. And I went, ha, I miss Caleb's. Jesse, I was there. I was in Rosie's head facing her. The doctor said, Mr. Kite, you want to watch? <laughs> Have you ever given somebody one of those looks that says, are you a total moron? <laughs> I gave one of those looks to the doctor. It's like, but what I said was, because Christians are supposed to be nice, I said, uh, no, I'm going to support my wife up here at the head. Wouldn't you know, the doctor said a few minutes later, Mr. Kite, you want to cut the umbilical cord? <laughs> I gave him the same look. <laughs> you would have thought he had gotten the idea. So I say all that to tell you, though I was there, I did not actually see Jesse's birth. So I don't know if this is true or not. But I have been told that we come into the world closed fists, like we're holding on to something. We're not going to let go. And Paul is saying, <clears throat> no, 
You brought nothing into the world. You're taking nothing out. You've heard the illustration before, but you never see a hearse with a U-Haul, right? Never a U-Haul trailer hooked up to a hearse. The, uh, we take nothing with us, nothing. In fact, Amanda has told me, Daddy, either catalog what you have or get rid of it now because we have no idea what you have. And if you walked into my garage, you would understand exactly what Amanda is going through. She's very concerned with the stuff. We bring nothing into the world, we take nothing out. Riches are fleeting. Number two principle is be content with what you have. And that's verse 8, which says, and if we have food and covering with these, we shall be content. What needs to happen, or what should happen is, we should be able to distinguish between our needs and our wants. Let me give you another example. I know today I'm talking a lot about myself, my apologies, but it was just very easy to do that. For as long as I can remember, I have always wanted a Mercedes Benz. In fact, I didn't need a Lamborghini or a Rolls Royce, I just always wanted a Mercedes Benz. I just thought they were the coolest car, the older ones, you know. And I have always wanted one. <coughs> I've never had one. Never got it. But you know what I have gotten? Every time I have needed a car, one has always been provided. A few I actually paid for, and God kind of protected me. I had one car that I called the cockroach, because it was a detestable vehicle. But I didn't want to call it that in front of people, so I called it the Kazant, which is Mandarin for cockroach. <laughs> I was I tried to learn Mandarin at one time, it was not pretty. But it ran, it got me where I wanted to go, it lasted long enough till I got a better car. God has always, always, always provided a car because it was a need. Mercedes, a want. So as we go through life, we need to distinguish what is a need and what is a merely a want. God knows what we need. Do you remember um, the book series, Little House on the Prairie? Well, in a few of those books, it talks about the life of the family. And they would go to an area that the father liked. It had very little like the TV show, so don't be thinking Michael landed in the TV show, okay? They would find an area that the father said, this is a good area, let's settle down, this is where we will live. And he spent his day partially just building a house while they lived in their wagon until, and every day he'd be cutting down trees and, you know, planing them and trimming them and putting them together and slowly building their 
one room house. But part of the day, he would go, have to go out and hunt for whatever creatures happened to be around. Rabbits or whatever. Fish, because he'd always be near our water. And that was the guy's life. The mother sewing the clothes, cooking the food, taking care of the children. The children doing the chores that would help with the clothing and the food and the house. Verse 8. You have clothing and food. That was all they had, and that's all they needed. He worked hard all day, and when he was done, he had a good rest. But his whole focus was food, clothing, well, food and house shelter. The wife, food, clothing. And so, God tells us that whatever he gives us, be content with it, be satisfied with it. The third principle is monitor what you are willing to do to get money. Be aware, think about it. This is found in verses 9 and 10. But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil, and some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many a pang. The question is, Paul's warning, has money become your God? Is that the main focus? And so we look at ourselves and think, how much energy am I willing to put into the pursuit of wealth? How much of my time, how much of my effort am I willing to put into just having more? Notice the word I use, more. Does God want us to have homes? Sure. In this country, does God want us to have vehicles? If we need it, yeah. Is it okay to have a boat on the side? Sure. It's fine. As long as it doesn't take God's place. Computer, TV, cell phone. Yeah, it's fine. That cabinet that has all those figurines in it. It's fine. Uh -huh. The guns. For some of you men who collect guns and stuff. It's fine. Things are fine. until they become God, until they become the priority. And that's what Paul is telling us in verses 9 and 10. How much energy are you using in the pursuit of wealth? Are there any compromises you're willing to make in the pursuit of wealth? Are there any corners you are willing to cut in the pursuit of wealth? We become aware of how we act towards finances because there is nothing wrong with wealth until it becomes our God, our priority, our focus. Now, principles four, five, and six actually don't happen until verses 11 um, to the, uh, basically to the end. I'm going to mention those this morning 
but we'll look at them in a little more detail when we get to verses 11 to the end, which <laughs> will start out next week, but how long it goes is another question. But you know, I mean, that's what's going to happen. So the fourth principle is love people more than money. And that is verse 11, which states, but flee from these things, you man of God, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. And so it's the idea of pursuing love. Love people more than money. Pursue love. Um, you've heard the expression, love people and use things, rather than love things and use people. So that's all we're saying today. But that's the fourth principle. The fifth principle is love God's work more than money. And that's also found in verse 11. And we see all of those words of righteousness, godliness, faith, gentleness, etc. And so we love what God's doing more than what we can get out of it. And then the sixth, the sixth principle at last is Freely share what you have with others. And that's found in verse 18. Instruct them, those who have wealth, to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. And again, we'll look at this verse in more detail when we actually get to it. Um, you know, sometimes I wish that the Holy Spirit would have just put scripture together to make it easier for a preaching outline. Um, but he doesn't. He puts it the way that he wanted to put it. So that's why this outline, I had to go out of the passage we were in and give you the other three verses, which we'll look at it in more detail at another time. If you've got nothing else from this morning, I hope that you remember there is nothing wrong with wealth. The most, one of the most misquoted verses in scripture is found right here. Because how many times have you said, oh, money is the root of all evil? No, it's not. It's the love of money that's the root of all evil. There is nothing wrong with money. There is nothing wrong with having things until it becomes your God, your focus, your priority. Then that verse kicks in. And many have suffered pain and destruction because of it. And we see it all the time. When ministers fall, Teachers of God's word, preachers. There's one of two ways they fall. Sexual immorality or money. That's why the warning is here. And the warning is not just for preachers, it's for any of us. Father God, thank you that you have given us all things to enjoy. You tell us that. You tell us that every good gift comes from you. You tell us that you will supply our needs. You tell us that you give abundantly beyond what we can ask or think. Lord, you're a giving God, and I thank you for that. Thank you for your care, your watchfulness. that you have us in your hand. Lord, give us the insight and the understanding of how to treat the things that you've given us. Help us. Because it must be a great temptation or you wouldn't have warned us so many times. 
Father, as always, I thank you for these who have come. I ask your blessing upon them. May you strengthen and encourage those who need it. For any who may have physical difficulties, may you put your healing hand upon them. Father, for any who may be struggling financially, may you keep your promise and supply everything that they need. Lord, I also want to pray for those who aren't here this morning. It's vacation time, Lord. Maybe that's where they are. May you help them to be strengthened today, wherever they may be. Father, may your spirit work in the hearts of those who have just gotten out of the habit of coming. Give them that desire to fellowship with other Christians again. Lord, we look forward to what you have for us this week. Give us the sensitivity to follow your meaning. Bring us back again the next time that we can continue to grow in you. And for all that you do, we give you praise, glory, 